When I came into recovery, I was very frightened, scared like most people. I didn't know how to change. I knew what I wanted to change, but I didn't know how to change. And I found change the most difficult experience I've ever had in my life. I had to find out what I wanted to recover from. And I didn't understand until I started watching children. And I seen all the children here today, and that's where I learned about my recovery, was studying children and observing young kids and how innocent they are. And they've no resentment, no fear, no bitterness. They just go on, mate. A child will look you right in the eye and tell you exactly what they think. They'll come right up to you and say to you, I don't like you. <laughs> and they have no fear of how you're going to respond or react. And a child will also run up to you and jump all over the top of you and cuddle you and tell you how much they love you. I see that they weren't material children and they didn't have to have the iPhone 6 and the iPad and all the other stuff. They'd rather play with the cardboard box and sit and play with the toys. So I had to look at why did I lose my innocence and when did I lose my innocence? And why did I start abusing my body and my mind with chemicals? And it took for me to see that I didn't know what love was. I didn't know how to love. I didn't know how to show it. Love to me was when I was getting my own way and everything was going right for me. But what I was recovering from was the damage that was done to me as a child. Because that's where it all comes from. Everything you see and everything you hear, you copy by example. It's the only way you can learn. So everything I saw being brought up in a dysfunctional home was normal to me. The behaviours, how people were dealing with feelings and emotions, watching them every single day for maybe 14, 15, 16 years or how long you're in that house. Watching the violence, listening to the lies, getting taught how to lie. Don't tell your dad this, don't tell your mum that, don't tell your brother this. So you're learning to lie. You're seeing stuff coming into the house, stolen, thinking it's okay. That was riddled with shame and guilt because my parents had split up when I was only five, and that was in 1963. And I never had a, a clue what was going on, the horrible feelings and the emotions. Full of shame, full of anger, full of guilt, feeling like a tramp, having to steal clothes off a washing line so I could fit in and be liked, lying constantly and stealing, looking what other people had that I didn't have, and believing if I had these things, I'd feel better about myself. And I started going out my way at a very young age and stealing, because I believed if I had these things, I wouldn't get slagged. But when I was getting slagged, I became very aggressive and very, very violent. I didn't know how to deal with my feelings and emotions. The only way I knew how to deal with them was the way I'd watched my dad, God rest him, deal with his. And he was very violent. And watching other people in my environment. So not being able to deal with these feelings and emotions, I started drinking and taking drugs and blaming. And I blamed my parents. And I was trapped in blame. I blamed my environment, the school, social workers, the church. I blamed everybody and I blamed the God that I was brought up with because I didn't understand how you could love a God and then have fear at the same time because fear is the complete opposite of love. And for me to come into recovery, I knew then I had to change my whole belief system, how I was thinking, how I was behaving, how I was reacting to stop blaming and learn to take responsibility for every thought that goes through my mind. Every feeling and every emotion belongs to me. I can't blame MD anymore. I'm coming in to recover for the damage that was done to me as a child. I don't talk much about drugs and alcohol because that's not my addiction. I don't I believe society gets that very wrong. My addiction is my thinking. The drug and the alcohol is just my painkiller and the other tablets and other stuff that I took was just my painkiller. I'd learned to take that to drown the, the, the voice in my head. Sometimes I had two and three voices going on in my head and I ended up getting locked up in mental institutions. The 17 drug and alcohol clinics. I'd lost everything in my life, just like most people in the fellowships. 
And I started begging. Ended up homeless. I ended up trying to take my own life on numerous occasions because I couldn't deal with these feelings and emotions. And nobody could teach me. I'd been to psychologists, psychiatrists, counselling. I'd seen them all. Nobody could teach me how to change. And I found that difficult. I picked up 12 spiritual steps. And I noticed that they weren't 12 steps. They were called 12 spiritual steps. Which gave me an understanding of a power greater than me that lived in me. And that God wasn't separate from me. The God that they spoke about. Because most people, like myself, have brought up with religion. Has brought up with a terrible fear and shame and guilt. And I'm, if I'd done something wrong, I was going to get punished. That's not a God that I have today. It's a loving God that lives inside the spirit. And when, this, when I'm doing the right things, taking responsibility for my thinking and my behaviours, the spirit lights up like you seeing a child. You watch an innocent child and you see the light shining right out of them. And how did I know I was a spiritual being having a human experience? How did I know that? Because I knew when all the doctors and the scientists and the psychologists and the psychiatrists didn't know when we're having a negative thought, why does the body react? When we're having a good thought, why do we feel joy? And that's how I knew I was spirit. Because when I'm going against the laws of spirit, and spirituality is just based on love and compassion. Being able to love other people and love yourself and being compassionate to yourself and other people. But that's very, very difficult when you've loved yourself and hated yourself and hated everybody else and hated the world and blamed the world. And to live that spiritual life, I had to take full ownership and believe that I was here and everything negative that happened in my life was a lesson for me. Because I learned that as a spiritual person, earth is my training ground for my spirit and people are my teachers. And every person that I hate and dislike and angry with, resentful, that's my higher power and the universe showing me these are the steps that you need to take to get well and recover when you start to see the good in yourself and the good in other people. Because when you're seeing the bad in yourself and the bad in other people, then it hurts in the body. You get that terrible turmoil inside the horrible butterflies. But when I'm seeing the good in myself and I'm seeing the good in other people, I've not got the horrible butterflies. It's full of joy, full of gratitude, full of peace. And that's what I desired. And that's what I had to come into recovery for and apply each step because each step had shown me that my life was already unmanageable before I even took the drink and the drugs. And then I had the shame and the guilt by the way I uh, treated my family, my son, and my, my wife, and other people. And being brought up with this Catholic shame and guilt, it was destroying me, it was eating away at me. Until I learned to meditate through these steps and step 11 showed me the connection that I built with this power, this energy through doing the right thing and believing and no doubting in this energy that lives within us. But the things that my higher power was showing me was the things that I didn't like. Because the spirit will speak to you in a soft voice and it only speaks once. And it's trying to guide us. And it's trying to direct us to bring us back to the innocence of the child. Where you don't have a care in the world. You don't worry about nothing. You don't have fear. You don't have any resentment, bitterness. You learn to understand yourself and what happened to you. And when you understand yourself and what happened to you, then you can understand other people. And through understanding yourself and understanding other people, it frees you from pain. You'll know why people are getting angry. You'll know why they're lying. You'll know why they're trying to manipulate you. Because when I came into the fellowship, all I'd done was look at other people and judge them and criticize them. And I was wondering why I kept relapsing and relapsing and feeling hurt and pain. And every person I attracted to me in my life was, had the same thoughts as me. Because like attracts like, and people with the same thinking patterns and behaviours attract one another. That's the power, the energy that we are, and we attract that energy. And it's just like thoughts. Thoughts are energy. And you know that when you're having a good thought, you feel positive and pure energy. But when you're having a negative thought, it burns away and eats away at your soul. 
But these Brahmaya powers showed me through meditation that these behaviours are now habits. And old habits die hard. And to recover, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It tells you that in the big book. This is a tall order. We can't do it all at once. So, my higher power showed me this is going to be difficult. But in between that, you're going to be learning patience, tolerance, acceptance, humility, understanding, and love. Again, it was frightening and scary to face your fear, which was other people. And being able to look them in the eye and say, sorry, I can't do that for you. I'm not doing that. I don't want to give you that. I'm not giving you it. Without having to justify why I was saying no, and I don't do that anymore. I'm simple no, and that's it. And this is where I learn to understand other people and not become aggressive and violent with them. Because I was a manipulator. I was a controller. But I had to recognise it within myself first. I had to control and I had to be in control to make me feel good and to make me feel safe. When I wasn't in control, I became very, very insecure. And when I was insecure, I ended up taking drinking drugs and other medications. To find the inner peace, I had to start really believing in that power and meditating on that power and that energy and facing my fear. And my higher power taught me that all fear, every single bit of fear in your life is just an expectation. That's all it is. We're expecting bad things to happen because we're gathering evidence in our mind and we're talking to ourselves and feeding the spirit with negativity and darkness which then comes out in the body. Because when you go against the laws of the spirit, it comes out in the body. That's why our bodies ache as human beings and we end up with cancers and heart diseases and tumours and arthritis and all these migraines, stress. And all these things happened to me. I ended up with Bell's palsy seven times in my face, spondylitis of the spine, burnt the lining in my stomach chronically, all through my thinking or through my behaviours. And when I took responsibility for the behaviour that was causing it, I got the healing. And the only way you get the healing is when you believe in the power that runs through you. And we take responsibility for the behaviour that caused the ailment or the disease or the illness to your body. And it's the same spiritual laws as you've got the authorities' laws. If you go against authorities' laws, you'll pay the price. If you don't pay your rent, become homeless. You don't pay your car, you get an MOT service and tax, you'll get fined. You go through a red light, you'll get fined. You're fighting in the street, drunk in the street, you'll get fined. Everything you do wrong in society, they'll fine you or jail you. It's the same with the spiritual laws. When you go against the laws of the spirit, which is love and compassion, you'll pay the price. And it comes out in our body, in aches and pains and diseases and illnesses. And why do you think all the hospitals are jam-packed? Why do you think every prison is full? And scientists, doctors, psychiatrists, they're only trained on the mind or the body. They're not trained on the spirit. There's millions and millions of people who talk the same as me, who have recovered the same as me. But to recover, I had to take responsibility, full ownership for my life. Because I only get this one shot at it. My higher power showed me not to blame anymore, not to blame my parents, because I blame my parents for being brought up like a tramp. And I blame them for all my stealing and not having an education. Because when I came into recovery, I couldn't read or write. I had no education. I left school at 14 and I started stealing. So I could fit in and be liked and loved, because there was no love in my house. And that wasn't my parents' fault. Because every behaviour is passed down from one generation to the next generation. And it's all learned behaviours. And there's not such a thing as a gene. And this gene just comes out and you start becoming obese and drug jagging. And when does this uh, gene do you just wake up one morning and you start jagging everywhere? No, it's learned. We don't know how to deal with life. We don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here. We don't know how to deal with feelings and emotions. And then when people are trying to teach us, the ego, the wee voice is coming in and saying, shut up, Baldy, what do you think? You don't know nothing. 
And it's through that sitting and listening to people and judging people who are trying to help me, criticising them, being frightened of them, thinking that they were better than me. That's how I couldn't learn. It was full of arrogance and pride and fear. And remember, fear is an expectation. False expectations appearing real in our mind. And then we begin to gather evidence. And we tell ourselves, bad things are going to happen. I'm not going to get that job. I'm going to fail my driving test. I'm never going to go, or what if I ask her out and she rejects me? Or what happens if I ask him to sponsor me and he rejects me? And you're away doing other people's thinking. And then you hear the words that man's invented, like rejection. No human being can reject us. Rejection is when you put 50 pence in a machine and it's stuck, and you press a button and reject it back out. That's rejection. A human being can't reject us. It's just what we've learned, and how we've learned to deal with other people, and how we've learned to respond and react to other people, and what they're saying, and what they're thinking. And if you look at, where did we lose the innocence? Like the children. Where, where did we lose that innocence? And you'll see around about seven and eight. Because you've all got children. And you can watch them around about seven and eight. And they've taught us how to deal with feelings and emotions. And you're going to school. And your child's coming in and asking you, can I get this, can I get that? I want this and I want that. But they never asked for that before. So they're starting to look at what other people have got that they have not got. And they believe if they've got that, they'll fit in and be light. Because mommy and daddy's not teaching them about feelings and emotions. There's nobody taught mummy and daddy how to deal with their feelings and emotions. So we all just go through life winging it, and winging it as parents. And every single person in this room, and I don't even need to ask you, when you were young, you swore at one point in your life you'd bring your children up different for the way you were brought up. And we think spoiling them with material things is what they need, when we all know it's love and attention. And when you're giving a child love and attention, its spirit is lifted. And it's so happy and joyful. And that's what we need to do with ourselves. So I looked at the behaviours, the way I was thinking, the way I was acting, the fear of other people, terrified of other people, pleasing them all the time, wanting them to like me, wanting them to love me. And when they didn't, and I didn't know how to deal with anything, I drank and I took drugs because of the pain. And really, I've learned so much with working with people. It's only words and thoughts. And words and thoughts have no power over you unless you run with them. But nobody teaches us spirituality. We're taught with religion. Spirituality, there's nothing wrong with religion. It's just that some of the people that teach it, a lot of it is based on control. Spirituality is about freedom, your own choice. You get 12 steps, it's a, a God of your own understanding. A power that you will feel through applying the 12 steps to your life especially step 11, when you learn. Because step 11 is sought through prayer and meditation to improve your conscious contact, conscious contact with the God of your understanding, praying only, only for the knowledge of his or her will for us and the power, power to carry that out. And that's how you know these steps are so powerful when you build that connection, when you stop doubting yourself and you stop doubting there's a power out there greater than us. And each step will show you where you separated yourself from that spirit. And that's how we need to keep coming back. And so a lot of people slip and relapse and don't come back. You have to come back. The universe and your guides will bring you back and bring you back because you'll see the things that's keeping you away is other people that were supposed to love and you're sitting in meetings and judging and criticising and getting angry and gossiping and criticising, going against the spirit, going against the 12 steps, going against your true self, which is love and compassion. And that's why you need to keep coming back, because the people that you're resenting, judging and criticising are your teachers. How do you expect to feel love? We come in here to change, a programme of change. And how are we expected to love if we're harbouring negative, bad, evil thoughts towards another soul. Because what you give out in thoughts comes back in feelings. As you think, so shall you be. For the way you think is the way you feel. And what you give out in thoughts comes back in feelings. And what you sow in this world 
is what you'll reap from it. And all these wee sayings are, are not there for <laughs> just to be swept under the carpet. Everything means something in life. To recover is to recover for the damage that happened to me as a child. And to stop blaming my parents and society because the universe would put me into that family to learn. That's why I'm here today. Because coming for a thief, drug dealer, money lender, 30 bob Glasgow gangster, to the person I'm at today was by applying the 12 steps and finding courage through these 12 steps to change the things that I can change and accept the things I couldn't change, which I can't change another human being. I can't control them. I have no power over another human being. I can't fix them. I can't make them take back what they've said. And I have to accept that. And it's the same with the fear we are children, when our children are going out at night. I've seen so many people relapsing through the fear and worry about their children are up to, because of the things that we were up to when we were children. And we're expecting them to be doing the same thing. Again, it comes down to that expectation. And expectations cause disappointment, and expectations causes a lot of pain, and expectations causes hatred and resentment and relapse. So I expect nothing from nobody, nothing, and that way I don't get hurt. This is a personal journey, this is your journey. Whether your family, drugs, alcohol, doesn't matter, it's the exact same 12 steps. It's the exact same illness. Every human being feels pain. Every human being has got feelings and emotions, and every human being has got lived experience. Because I used to think it was only people who had recovered from drugs and alcohol that I could work with. But every human being has got lived experience because every human being has got the same feelings and emotions. It's just that we've learned to deal with them differently. The way we were raised to deal with them. And every person in this room has got what I've got. I'm no different for anybody. No different. I tapped into the courage that lay within me and I learned to face my fear of other people and not to please them. To help them, to support them but not to please them. Because when I'm people pleasing, the message I'm giving to that person is you're better than me, and I want you to like me, and I want you to love me, and I don't want you to say anything bad about me. So you go about telling everybody that that guy Jerry's a really nice guy. Because I wanted everybody to like me, and I went through my whole life pleasing them, and then picking up resentment. Doing something for somebody that I didn't want to do, but doing it anyway because of my fear and then going home at night and harbouring resentment, living in a world of, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. I knew I shouldn't have done that and then sit and punish myself. And you're wondering why it takes a wee bit of time for us to recover. Because the way you've been thinking, acting and behaving, you've been doing it since you were eight. And old habits die hard. And some people think they can't change and they'll tell themselves the famous Glasgow word. I can't do that. I can't, because I'm scared and I don't want to. You can change when you, you know how to change and what to change. And if you look at the first ferry, all the steps, the spiritual steps, they're showing you how to build back the connection with the Spirit, with the Divine. And each step, the earlier steps, are showing you where you separated yourself from the Spirit, the Divine. Powerless and unmanageable, unmanageability lives. No cause of the drink and the drugs, because of the damage it was done to us and what we learned. Came to believe in a power greater than yourself, could, could restore you to sanity. It doesn't say would, it says could. I had to find out who I was praying to. Was I still praying to this God that I was raised with as a child, that I was frightened to? No. I was I praying to a power within me, an energy that can heal me and teach me wisdom to know the difference? Yes, that's who I prayed to when I built that connection and things started going right in my life. Because when I changed how I, f I was thinking, how I was behaving, how I was reacting and responding to other people, my circumstances changed. Great things started happening in my life. I learned to read and write. I learned to work as a volunteer. I learned to drive, it all get paid for, working as a volunteer. I still work as a volunteer 21 years later. I run a wee drop-in centre in Glasgow and I teach people how to deal with feelings and emotions, which nobody else does out there. And we use our own lived experience to help give people identification 
which counselling tells you not to do. We use our own experience of the shame and the guilt and the fears and all the things we're frightened of, and we teach people why we've done it, why we spoke to people that way, why we treated people that way, because of the fears and insecurities that we were born with, we come into this world with. But these 12 steps are so powerful. It brings you joy, peace and happiness. But you really got to believe in yourself that you can change. You cannot doubt it. All you're asked to do is change you. No change the world, change your family. Just change you and how you think and how you see yourself and how you see other people. And that's all we're asked to do is change. That's what the serenity prayer is for. God grant me, me, the serenity. Because I need that serenity, first of all, to help me understand. And when I've got that serenity, I can learn to accept the things I can't change. I can't change the past. I can't change the future. I can't change other people's minds. I can't change how they think. I can't change how they behave. And if you look at the courage to change the things you can, which is us, that's all we can change is us. So you find that courage through your faith and you start to change yourself. You believe in yourself. You trust in yourself. You find new hobbies, new interests. You start facing your fears and listening to that wee voice in the head that's destroying you. Because it's only a voice. There's nobody else there. The next time you're hurting, I'm wondering about you. Because that's what my higher power taught me, the wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. And what you're saying to yourself and telling yourself Jerry's wrong because it's hurting you, and you need to take responsibility for the words that you're putting into your mind and soul. And that took courage. First of all, I had to learn to listen to these thoughts, and no run with them, but to challenge them. And then eventually, what I do today is I don't answer them back, because they're energy, and they'll just go away, because I'm not feeding them. So the thought will just go away, and it'll go somewhere else. And that's how you can learn to live in the moment, and live in the now and learn to trust yourself, that the only thing that's hurting us is us. And when you learn to take responsibility for that and challenge these horrible negative thoughts, you start to find the peace in your life and you start to see the changes happening. Your circumstances will change, your health will change, your finances will change, your relationship will change, because you're starting to live by the laws of spirit and you've started to apply these 12 spiritual steps, taking responsibility and ownership your behaviours, the way you think, act and behave towards yourself and other people. But it lives in you. You've got it. You are powerful. You're more powerful than you could ever imagine. The strength and the courage, the love that lies in every person in this room is mind-blowing. And you feel that energy when you start to see the good in yourself, see the good in others. And look at your insecurities about the money, about sex, about partners, about loneliness, abandonment. You start to look at all these words that man has invented and these words have ended up destroying us. You look at the spiritual words, they're all uplifting words. And they'll lift your spirit and they'll lift you to a different place and a different dimension. And that's the power of these 12 steps. And that lies in everybody in here. And I mean that. I am no different for anybody in here. Everybody's got to learn to believe and challenge your thought process. Look at your belief system and look at where you're gathering this false evidence that's hurting you and destroying you. There is no pain in this moment. Now, there is no pain. When I leave this moment and I start getting to the future, it's going to cause pain. It's going to cause anxiety. I have no power over the future. And if I'm going to get into the past, it's going to cause a lot of regret and a lot of pain in my life. I learned from my past. I know not to get into the future. All I have is a now. And that's where the peace lies. So I'm very, very, very grateful to be asked up here today to speak to you. And I'm very grateful to be clean and sober.